Hello, we're going to talk about practical parenting tips to support the brain. Simple things you can do every day that makes neural networks grow stronger and more robust in your children. Okay, I hope you're ready. Let's go. So let's talk about the brain. The brain never stops changing. What we do in the world changes the way our brain forms. The same thing for what the world gives us also changes the way our brain is formed. So we're growing tons of neural connections when we're little. What changes is the number of these skinny lines, the axons, the dendrites, those are the connections. And that's what's growing like crazy during development. Now, overcrowded connections are really inefficient. And think of it this way. You're like the little family circus kid and you're going from point A down here to point B up here. But how are you going to get there? It's, it's crazy jungle. It's a tangled web. And so you take this crazy circuitous route and you go everywhere before you get there, right? That's why it takes kids forever to do anything. It's not a problem. We know it's going to take them forever. So we just need to allow time for it. But these overcrowded connections, you can tell, are inefficient. It takes a long time to get from point A to point B. So what the body does is it prunes away what we're not using. And this is why active engagement on the child is so important, because the brain is going to prune away what we don't use. This improves the efficiency of our neural networks, all right? So we say use it or lose it. And in Montessori terms, you say every unnecessary aid is an obstacle to development. And here you can see Dr. Montessori working with the geometric cabinet with a child and the child is doing the work. The child is tracing it. And you can see here, Dr. Montessori showed her how to do it. But then as soon as the girl gets it, Dr. Montessori stops and she's watching. And now it's the child's work. Dr. Montessori only steps in if the child needs a little support or scaffold, okay? Otherwise, we let the children do the work because we want them to grow their strong neural connections. We already have strong neural connections. We don't need to grow them anymore, okay? So it's the kids' work. Okay, great. In neuroscience, we say practice makes permanent, okay? Not perfect, permanent. So we want to engage the children in all aspects of daily life. We do not want to do everything for them. No mommy made, okay? We're encouraging them, we're engaging them to do the part that they can do. And everything that happens all day long, getting dressed, cooking, cleaning, socializing, they need opportunities to socialize and learn how to speak and form intelligent sentences, take care of plans, organize their belongings, shopping, everything that we can, okay? But again, just the part that they can do. We're not overwhelming them with asking them to do everything. And this is going to create strong neural networks because practice makes permanent. This is from the Kavanaugh Report, which you can check out on the internet, and pictures from her home and how she's made it accessible for her children. She has several children. This is her second youngest. And here you can see the waning chair, so the child actually can get out on their own. They're not trapped like in a high chair. We want them to have some freedom so they can start to make choices and see the consequences of their choices, okay? They have this floor bed for the same reason. They're not in a crib, which by the way is associated with a lot of injuries with children every year and even deaths from cribs. Get rid of the crib, floor bed, much safer, baby proof the whole room, and then the child has freedom and opportunities to move, right? Essential for them to be moving and exerting themselves on the world around them. Same things with clothing. Here we have, I love this, they have just one little basket for socks. She has one little basket for underpants and things are in one defined, clear space. Now, why we want them to do this is because the more that they do things, the more efficient they get at it. And this is really obvious when we think about, you know, the toddler who needs help putting on their shoes versus the preschooler who can do that by themselves. It's easier for them to do it the more experience they get. As you master a skill, the brain becomes more efficient at using the skill. Okay, and so this is why cleaning, you definitely want to be cleaning with your little one when they're little, because then it's effortless for them to do it when they're older. If you wait till they're older, it's so much harder. Not impossible, but so much harder. Okay, so let me show you this example from research. So on the left here, we have this brain at age 11, and it's showing you what areas of the brain are active when a child is reading. You can see they're using a lot of different brain real estate from a lot of different regions. It's not just, you know, like they read here. No, there's a lot of parts of the brain. You need the whole brain to do anything, okay? And you use a lot more when you're first learning a skill. Now you think age 11, they're probably a pretty decent reader. Yeah but they're still not a master. It's not effortless for them, right? It takes a long time to master some skills. Now look at us when we're 38. We're 
hardly using anything in our brain when we're reading, okay? We're using these tiny spots because we've refined all our networks. They're super efficient because we've had a lot of experience doing it. So that means we have all this other real estate available so we can do other things. So our movement areas in the brain are actually intrinsically connected with our thinking regions. This is wild, right? You think movement is just kind of random, but no. Movement and cognition are like best friends, right? They're hand in hand, they go together. In fact, kids who are more active have more brain power, literally, and better executive functions than other kids. And you can see that your executive functions, when you're born, this is, you know, proficiency, low proficiency to high proficiency. And this is our age going across the bottom. And you can see we're very low, of course, when we're born. And then it goes kind of boom, there's this huge surge, right? And then there's another bump here. All right, so what's happening here? First of all, that's the, the preschooler between ages and three and six where we get this big pump. And then it happens again in adolescence, all right? So that's what's going on. This development comes in spurts specifically for executive functions and it's in those particular spurts that we especially need to give children the opportunity to make choices and see the consequences of their choices, freedom with limits. And so just so you know, I'm way up there. I'm lower than most, my son, my son, 17. Okay, so freedom with limits. What do we mean about this? This is training a child's executive functions. The child needs to be free to choose their activities, right? To the, from what's available, uh, work at their own pace, repeat as much as they need, but they're not free to do anything that's dangerous, destructive, or demeaning. So emotions are also a part of our learning. And this freedom with responsibility is really important for developing their, un, their executive functions. And emotional regulation is part of that, okay? So when we're talking about emotional regulation, we're talking about understanding that you're experiencing a feeling, an emotion, right? And then realizing that you have some choice and how you respond to that perception. Their behavior is this serve. It's giving you an opportunity to come back at them with something that is skillful and helpful for them, right? They call it serve and return. But supportive relationships are key. So we're talking about social emotional learning as well as social cognition. I just want to point you to a leading researcher in the field. Her name is Mary Helen Imordino Yang. She is a, my friend and idol. I, I love Mary Helen. And here's one of her quotes from her papers. All learning is inherently social and emotional. She's doing a lot of research on adolescence and emotional learning and on these three brain networks. So there's many networks in the brain and I'm just gonna talk about three that Mary Helen looks at in her work. First, there's the default mode network and this is what our brain does when we're not intentionally doing anything. We kind of default to this pattern of activity, right? That's where we might be daydreaming. We're just mind wandering off task, right? Thinking about others, right? Like reflecting, that's the default mode network. And then there's the saliency network. And this is kind of what allows us to notice what we're doing, that we're daydreaming. Oh, and I have to turn my attention back to this project I have to do. Or, oh, this, um, I'm daydreaming and something on the stove is burning. I have to turn my attention back to that, okay? So the salience network notices what's happening. And then the central executive network. This is where we make decisions on how we want to respond to what's happening in the world, how we want to direct our actions, to manage our time, to plan our lives and our days, okay? So these are three key networks. There are many others. So, but the key thing I want to draw your attention to here is the saliency network, because this is just noticing. Saliency is noticing and deciding what we think about something. Do we think it's good to keep daydreaming? Or do we think we have to get back to our homework, right, if we're a teenager? Do we think it's good to be um, totally hyper-focused on work all the time? Or do we need to take a break and let our mind wander? That saliency is determining this balance between off-task, on-task, on-task, off-task right? So that self-regulation is really what's happening with that saliency network. So toileting, I have to get to toileting. This is a huge, huge thing for a lot of parents of young children, and it requires self-monitoring. So in the process of learning to toilet, children are learning to self-monitor. So they're exercising their saliency network, all right? And they're deciding not to be passive in the default mode and just like, oh yeah, now there's poop but instead to be active in this executive and go to the potty and use it, okay? Here's a couple of pointers to give you some help with toileting. First of all, use cloth. 
The diapers that we have today are too effective. Children don't even know that they're wet. They don't even know. They're getting no environmental feedback. They have this experience of releasing urine and then they have no sensory feedback that, that makes things wet, right? Use cloth, it makes a huge difference in that. The other thing is when you're using cloth, it'll be more obvious when they start to hold it. And once they start to hold it for a couple of hours, that's when they're ready to start toilet training. That usually happens around 18 to 24 months. It varies for different children, but that's generally how it goes. Okay, you can go to Monty Kids and you can order your own toileting kit, right? So you'll have everything you need. So we're involving the child in all aspects of using the, the potty, right? Changing, dressing, cleaning, everything, all right? We don't want to take away parts of it. So one thing that helps is having a routine when you're first starting out. Just plan on things being messy when you first start. And it's not a problem that they're going to be messy, okay? Because they're first, they're, they're not salient yet. They're not noticing that they need to go. They might be really focused on something else and they forget to toilet. They can't toggle out of that central executive network, right? It's okay. Protecting their concentration is more important. This will develop naturally. And they're going to have accidents. Things are going to be messy, especially the first few days it's going to be really messy. Just like clear your calendar. Don't plan on going anywhere, right? Just stay home and be ready to, to clean. And, and it's all about the toilet, right? The thing about the accident is that it's not a problem. We can expect them to happen and we don't have to be concerned about them. It's nothing wrong. You're like, oh, you're wet. That's all. Let's change. And then you help them as needed show them how to do as much as they can on their own, including cleaning up. It can be really messy when you're first starting. There can be a lot of mess on the floor. Prepare the environments so that the children can participate in cleaning up the mess. You're not going to abandon them to do it themselves. You can see in this picture, you've got Hazy and her daughter working together on this, okay? It's not like she's just saying, you go clean it. No, we have to help, okay? But this is the start. We're getting them into the process of it. So why, why this matters so much to me, this not shaming or being upset about a child who has an accident is because of what's actually going on in the brain. And it's stress, an acute stress response is what we're creating. So first of all, typically when our executive system is working well, right, a lot of our activities in the front of our brain, it's not only in the front of our brain, we need our whole brain to do anything, but a lot of our activity is up here. And that's a calm, alert state. Okay, very happy, brain's working well. Okay, we have an acute stress response. Somebody corrects us, maybe we made a mess and someone goes, oh, you made such a mess. And we're like, oh, and we kind of startle. That's literally, I think, the feeling of this activity leaving the front of our brain and going down into our fight or flight limbic system, right? Amygdala emergency response system. Okay, and that means because that activity has shifted when we have this acute stress response, we're not using the smarter thinking parts of our brain to respond to the situation. We're reactive rather than proactive, right? That's what happens in an acute stress response. So when you think about that, you know that's not a teachable moment. When, if someone is having an acute stress response, then it's like they're having a tantrum. We just need to witness, verbalize what's happening, and be patiently waiting for them to move on so that their brain regulates and can then think again, okay? So those tantrums, those acute stress responses, not teachable moments. Later, the teaching, the guidance from Montessori is to wait for a neutral moment later and then represent whatever it is that they need support in understanding what is happening. But it's not necessarily the same day. The neutral moment is a different time so that it's not connected with the, with the stress response. So bedtime is another area that's often difficult, and it can also be stress-free. We've talked about physical activity and how important that is, and adequate daytime exercise is one of the most important ways, I think, that you can really help children settle in to bed at night. Other things are it's really to have routines, and they call this in the research, they call it sleep hygiene or cognitive behavioral therapy, where you have specific procedures and routines that you follow every evening before bed, so it's quite predictable. So at different ages, different children need different levels of adult guidance and support, right? And then this first plane of development, the first phase, children are sensory explorers. You can see he's eating his foot, right? Over here, he's eating his foot because he's learning about everything through the senses. That's what young children do, 
okay? It's all about taking in the information. That's why they're touching everything. That's why they're running everywhere to get into everything, right? That's their job developmentally. They need to do that to answer this question, what is the world? So what is our role with these children of all these different ages? So in the Montessori view, our purpose is to be a role model of gracious, compassionate, courteous behavior, and that allows them to adapt skillfully to the social environment. Okay, we want to recognize and understand what the child is doing. So we're always observing, non-judgmentally observing what they're doing so that we can support what is skillful and redirect what is not skillful. Okay, so we want to give them a lot of opportunities for, for great stuff. Okay, great language, uh, great motor skill development, great interesting art and the richness of human culture. We want to give them all of that, right? And if they have unskillful behavior, we redirect it. If it's a tantrum, we pause, wait for it to pass. We don't pretend it didn't happen. We help them give them the words to understand what's going on. And then we redirect them to something that is skillful. And then if you're interested in looking deeper on anything, there's a bazillion references here. I always want you to be able to follow up and see uh, the data behind what was presented. Okay, I hope this was useful. Good luck.